I've been planning today's show for a while now, ever since hearing from a member of our community that she was bringing her family over to Eastern Europe for Christmas next year and asking if I had any recommendations. Boy, do I. (laughs) And since I've been listening to travel podcasts for the last 15 or so years, I just can't resist the chance to try it for myself just this once. So today, we're deviating a bit from our usual focus on creative teaching, because sometimes travel helps recharge your creative teacher batteries. Plus, if you love to travel, you can build it into your curriculum with a virtual travel research project. So really, this episode can count as curriculum research, right? Eastern Europe might seem from a distance to be somehow stuck in a gray post-communist cloud, but... Boy, oh boy, the part that I am sure isn't. So come with me today on a little tour of my family's favorite spots in this part of the world. And I hope someday they become some of your favorites too. Hey there, I'm your host, Betsy Potash, and one-pagers, project-based learning, and choice reading are my jam. I believe in you, and my goal is to help you explore all the creative possibilities you dream of for your classroom. I'm an educator, a chocolate cake aficionado, a traveler who can't wait to get back to Barcelona, and the kind of mom who brings her own mini maker space to her kid's classroom when she comes to volunteer. I know this for sure, creativity isn't always easy. As a creative teacher, you get parent calls you treasure, and plenty of sidelong comments you'd rather forget. But here's the bottom line, creative education can ignite a spark in your students and change their lives forever. You and I know this. You're an innovator, and while it's sometimes hard, it's so worth it. So let's explore the world of creative education together. Welcome to the Spark Creativity Teacher Podcast. Okay, so here we go. We're going to be talking about four places today. We're going to talk about two cities, one region, and one entire country. So let's start with our most northerly destination, and that is Prague. We've been to Prague four times now, and it feels a little bit different every time, different times of year, different weathers, uh, different atmospheres. We've been there kind of during COVID and after COVID. I've walked through a huge rally in support of Ukraine in Prague, where I was standing in the middle of thousands of people waving blue and yellow flags and listening to speeches in Czech. I've run over the Charles Bridge in the early morning mist and just happened upon a music video shoot, which was really crazy and cool. I've wandered through the Christmas markets, feeling very cold, but very happy. And I've been there with my kids just kind of hanging out. We went to this family place, Bohemia Boards and Brews with the kids and ordered popcorn and played board games and discovered our family's true love of the Danish pub game, Klask, which I highly recommend. (laughs) Prague is a really colorful, fun city. It feels old in some parts. You walk across the Charles Bridge, you look at different kind of towers and castles and you think, man, this has been the same for hundreds and hundreds of years. But then other parts feel so fresh and modern and whimsical and they're painted in pink and green and yellow and um, it just feels really bright. I would say that Prague has pretty much completely wiped out all traces of communism. This is something that my husband and I have always found really interesting. We used to live in Bulgaria, and in Bulgaria, you can still see communism everywhere. You see these socialist realist sculptures downtown. You see huge block buildings all over the place. It feels like communism was a few days ago. Um, Prague, on the other hand, although it was communist through the same time period as Bulgaria, just obliterated it. You know, I mean, you can still read about it in books about Prague. There's one tiny museum called the Museum of Communism, which is just fascinating. And it's like it's like the size of, you know, an, a normal house. It's very small. It's above a McDonald's in a hugely ironic, I think purposeful, (laughs) situational choice. Um, And you can go through it and sort of be immersed in in communist life uh, in Prague from, from decades ago. But other than that, it just feels like this European capital that that never went through that period, um, which is pretty interesting. 
So let me tell you about some of our favorite things to do in Prague. Of course, I'm sure we've only touched the tip of the iceberg, even in four visits. Prague is a huge, amazing city, but here are some things I would really recommend. You'll want to just wander around the old town, starting in the main square. The main square is very easy to find. <laughs> it's a huge square with a huge sculpture in the middle. At Christmas, it has a ginormous Christmas tree. There's this very famous astronomical clock. Uh, my kids are always highly underwhelmed by the show that the astronomical clock puts on every hour on the hour. But when you think about it, this little show that's created by the mechanism inside the clock has been running for over 500 years straight. And I think that's what makes it amazing. It's not the show itself. In the 21st century, we've all seen some pretty amazing shows and little, you know, wooden figures clanging bells are not it. But when you think that this has just been happening day in and day out, every hour through, wars through you know redrawing of borders through the falling of governments it's kind of amazing <laughs> so anyway check out the show modest though it may be and and think about you know all the years that it's been happening wander around the square wander out into the surrounding streets and just kind of take it all in the beautiful little lanes the colorful buildings the the amazing sculptures Another thing we really love to do in Prague every time that just doesn't get old is to go back and forth across the Charles Bridge. Do it in the early morning. Do it at night. <laughs> do it in the middle of the day when it's packed with people. The Charles Bridge has so much personality and there are all these sculptures going across it that are different and that are interesting in their own ways. There are artists sitting along the bridge that are offering their earrings or their paintings or their caricatures and you can just kind of loiter along and look at the art. Most times when we go across during the main day there's a band um, playing some kind of fun funky music. Our kids always like to stop and listen. Our daughter likes to dance. We put money in the guitar case or whatever and hang out for a while and listen to the music with with the crowd and it's lots of fun. Another thing that we have repeated over and over is to wander up the castle hill. So there are two sides of Prague. There's the kind of old town square side and then you go across the Charles Bridge and on the other side is the castle. Um, and it's lots of fun to just walk up the hill toward the castle. You go up these, this huge staircase. The last time we went up, there was somebody there with these beautiful pet pigeons <laughs> that he let our kids hold and pet and take pictures with. Um, anyway, you get up to the top and you can walk around up there for free through the through the castle area and kind of see the outside of the cathedral or you can pay and you can go into the the cathedral and sort of through more museum type areas and through this little street called the golden lane that is a very pretty old part of the castle district where um, various service providers used to live who who did things for the community in that area but they're like these tiny little beautiful houses and you can kind of look inside and see the history okay this is where the dressmaker lived or this is where the goldsmith lived um but it is very crowded <laughs> so you might want to time that to to be at the very opening or the you know on a on a day that's not so popular also near the castle on the hill you can go kind of across that side of Prague and up a little higher and you get to this basically like a small Eiffel Tower which is at the top of Prague and you can climb up it when we were there the elevator was broken so we climbed up all the stairs I think usually you can take an elevator ride get to the top and look out over the whole city I will tell you that if it's really windy you can feel this mini Eiffel Tower moving <laughs> which was a bit um disorienting for me and my daughter did not care for it so if you don't like heights maybe you don't want to climb the mini eiffel tower but it is cool to look out and see all of prague spread out below you 
Okay, last but not least, a couple of food recommendations. We have repeatedly returned to the restaurant Laboratorio della Pizza. We love it. We love the bakery Arctic Bakehouse. Arctic, not like Arctic, Arctic. Um, and I love the little bakery in the old town called The Bake Shop. There's a tiny, tiny outlet of it on the Castle Hill side. That one's not as good. It's it's fine, but it's tiny. The other one is huge with so many different pastries and cakes, and it's just fun to sit in the window and have something to eat. It's called the bake shop. The other thing you should look for when you're in Prague is called Terdelnik, which basically means like a chimney cake. It's a donut type thing that's wrapped around a metal pole and then spun over coals or fire to roast it and and it is so good (laughs) it's like it's like a roasted cinnamon sugar donut that you can fill with anything you can fill it with ice cream or whipped cream or nutella you can put fruit on top there's a stand selling one of these like every three blocks all over Prague you're gonna see it everywhere so you should try it okay so that's Prague destination number one destination number two is Budapest Budapest has become our absolute favorite weekend with our family and it's kind of ironic because when my husband and I lived in Bulgaria before we had kids we went to Budapest once for the weekend and we had the worst time it was like our worst trip while we were living abroad the heat in our apartment was broken we went to the Museum of Communist Sculptures there which is a really interesting museum across the city but we went like in February and our bus dropped us off there and it didn't come back for us um for four hours like we didn't have a car so we couldn't go to the museum without taking a specific museum bus which we did and for some reason they make you stay for four hours and you can enjoy the museum in about a half an hour (laughs) so we were just sort of standing out there in this field of sculptures for four hours absolutely freezing so anyway, it wasn't the best, but <laughs> we went back with our family and and we absolutely love it now and we just make sure not to get stuck in any frozen fields for four hours. So one of the top things to do in Budapest by all accounts is to visit their baths and I agree. <laughs> they are so cool. We went to Sejeni last year with, with the kids. It's this sort of incredible building that feels like a palace um, with all of these indoor baths and, and this huge outdoor pool complex as well. And you you buy your ticket and you come in and you'll see these kind of vast rooms tiled in different beautiful colors with different differently temperatured water. <laughs> I'm probably saying that wrong. I don't know how to describe it exactly. But you know, there'll be like this small pool is at this temperature, this large pool is a little warmer, this this pool is a little cooler. This is the cold plunge pool. This is the super hot pool. This is the pool that spins you around like with a wave current. Um, this is the pool just for swimming. There's there's just all these different pools and everybody's just relaxing and talking and having a great time. Now I will tell you that Sejeni is the most famous, but it's not actually the most kid friendly. So I went with my two young kiddos and I I found out right before we went in that actually kids really aren't <laughs> there. It's not that they're not welcomed. I mean, it was fine, but they're not supposed to be playing and splashing and cannonballing. And so I had to tell them like, okay, you guys, we need to be respectful and chill. And they did. Um, but we spent probably more time than I would have otherwise in the big outdoor pool, which felt a little more friendly to playing. Um, but there are a lot of different baths and some of them are designed more for kids. So you can take a look. I'm going to link in the blog post for this um, podcast to a really cool website. If you're going to go to Budapest, you should check out this website. It's called Offbeat Budapest and they have tons of ideas for Budapest. And one of one of their articles is all about all the different fun and funky baths in Budapest. So you can check that out. Okay, after Sejeni, our other favorite thing, actually really for the kids, it's definitely their favorite favorite, is um, called the Flipper Museum. And really, 
You guys, I can't get over how cool this place is. If you've ever played an arcade game in your life and thought like, I wish I didn't have to keep putting in quarters to play this. I mean, this is so fun, but it's so limited. Then the Flipper Museum is for you. It's got maybe a hundred or so classic arcade games and pinball machines going way back. All my husband's favorites from his childhood are there. All my favorites, all my children's now new favorites. You pay, I don't know, maybe 10 euros or something and you go into the museum and you can stay for as long as you want all day. You can go out and have lunch and then come back. Your ticket is good. And then you play. Everything is set to free play. You can play every single machine for as long as you want. And man, do our children love it. It is so fun. It is so different from anything else we've ever done as we've crisscrossed Europe as a family. Um, and they just have a blast. It is like such nostalgic bliss for my husband. It is just super fun for the kids to play things, to watch each other play things, to help each other. Um, for me, you know, I, I enjoy it for an hour and then I would like to go do something else, <laughs> but everybody's different, right? Okay. Another fun thing to do in Budapest is to wander just as in Prague, like walking around the old town, you're going to see so many things, things that you don't even expect. You just get out, take a walk areas. I recommend for your walk, explore along the river, um, on the main old town side and like go near the huge parliament building on the river. If you kind of walk that way and then go up and around the neighborhood of the parliament building, you're going to see a lot of cool buildings and a lot of history. Another thing we've enjoyed is walking across the bridge to the hillside of Budapest and um, climbing up Liberty Hill. So there's a huge sculpture you can see from the city way at the top of the hill, the Liberty Sculpture. And um, it's fun just to wander up there. There's a path leading up the hill. It kind of crisscrosses back and forth. And when you get up there, you see the sculpture and then you crisscross back down. It's not that the sculpture is so amazing. Um, in fact, it was sort of under construction when we went last time. But we just enjoyed the wander up the hill and then seeing all of Budapest laid out below us. And then when we were coming down, we found this really fun playground too on the hill coming back down, which is, of course, always a joy when you're with kids. All right, another really great place to take a walk is in the area around Fisherman's Bastion and to see Fisherman, Fisherman's Bastion itself. This is like this amazing, beautiful, white marble building series. It's like a, na it's like a small neighborhood built out of beautiful white stone um, on the hillside of the city, kind of close to the castle. And we didn't actually go up and explore around the castle. We just went straight over to Fisherman's Bastion once we had walked along the bottom of the castle. And it is just beautiful and there's beautiful views from it out over the river and the parliament building. And you can take some really fun pictures there um, of Budapest and uh, of your family if you want to. Okay. Margaret Island is like the, the fun zone of Budapest for families, and we're all about that. <laughs> we, we have gone to Margaret Island almost every time we've gone, and they have this attraction there called the Singing Fountain, which might sound a little bit, you know, lame, but actually it is so much fun. We love watching the Singing Fountain. It puts on shows, I think, every hour, and... Um, they're 15 minute shows. Each one has has fountains choreographed to three different songs. So you're going to see a show with three different sort of styles of fountain dancing. <laughs> it is it is really fun. It is really a joy to watch the singing fountain. I think you'll like it. I think your kids will like it if you bring kids. So we like to see the singing fountain and then we walk a little bit deeper into the island. Sometimes we eat a meal there at one of the restaurants. Sometimes we just go wander through all the gardens and the park. We have one specific tree we always go to that's an incredible climbing tree and we hang out there. Um, probably at some times of year, maybe you could swim in the river. I'm not sure. We've never been there right at the height of summer because we're back in the U.S. in the summer. Okay. And again, we're going to wrap up with food. And food is maybe 
Well, I can't say it's our favorite thing about Budapest. The bath, the flipper museum are also so great, but man, is the food good. Budapest just tastes so good. You're going to want to go to a gelato place called Gelato Rosa. It is incredibly popular. You will stand in a line, but it's a happy line. And they have all these really unique, cool local flavors alongside classic flavors. Like I, I had a type of gelato there called cherry soup, and it was amazing. Um, but you you get your gelato sculpted into a flower. <laughs> so each type of gelato you get becomes a series of petals if you have three flavors, which I totally recommend because even with three flavors, your flower isn't going to be that big. Um, they're, going to, they're going to shape each flavor into a, a row of petals and make you this complex flower of, out of gelato. And every single person who walks out then tries to figure out a way to take a picture of their ice cream cone before they eat it because they're just so pretty um so i would definitely go there i would probably go there every day that you're in budapest there's also a very lovely bakery super close to gelato rosa called Che dodo and if you can make room they make the coolest macarons so it'd be really fun if you like macarons or if you wanted to try macarons they have really unique flavors really lovely traditions and just beautiful packaging. Everything about it just feels special at Shea Dodo. Then our family's favorite restaurant in Budapest is called Mazel Tov. It is a type of um, restaurant called a ruin bar, which has become a popular thing in Budapest, where, where a restaurant takes over kind of like an old building that was falling apart a little bit and turns its courtyard into a beautiful restaurant. So it's like something splendid in the middle of something a little bit old and crumbly. And so Mazel Tov um, has sort of trained all these gorgeous plants to be growing around the walls and spilling over the balconies. They have lights strung up everywhere. The food is absolutely delicious. It's Israeli food. We love the hummus and the fresh pita. We love the lemon chicken soup. We pretty much love everything we've gotten. They've made like special hot chocolates for our kids. It's just, it's such a pleasant experience and it's a fun place to people watch too. People are like out and about at Mazel Tov. When we first started going, it would be quite empty, but now it is absolutely incredibly popular. So I would just hop online and make a reservation there for whenever you want to go for lunch, for dinner. It's not, it doesn't feel pretentious. Um, you know, we don't feel like we need to super dress up before we go to Mazel Tov, but we do uh, think it's a good idea to make a reservation. And then finally, we found this bakery close to our Airbnb one morning that turns out to actually be like very highly rated, so good. It's called the Iran Bakery, and we like to go there every day. <laughs> so I recommend the Iran Bakery. Okay, a special quick note for those who might be traveling in search of Christmassy things. If you go in the winter and you celebrate Christmas and you would like to see Christmas markets, Budapest is my top number one recommendation for this region for Christmas. It is just amazing for Christmas. There are several huge Christmas markets in the Old Town area, and they do these light shows, which I haven't seen so much in other places. I saw them a little bit in France, but really they're very special in Hungary. Um, they light up the, the beautiful buildings behind the Christmas markets with different Christmassy light shows. I don't quite know how else to describe them. The, the lights keep changing to different Christmas-themed displays and it's it's very fun <laughs> so I would really recommend it that you know you're gonna get some cherry strudel some glue vine some delicious foods um, you can go ice skating you can go to all the Christmas markets and then like the things that we already love about Budapest are still good in winter for the most part you can still wander everywhere you can still go to the baths um, because they have big indoor portions, you can still go to the Flipper Museum. So honestly, like you, you are going to have a great time, in my opinion, in Budapest for the holiday season for Christmas if you if you celebrate Christmas. Okay, uh, next up 
is the whole country. I couldn't limit myself to one city in this country. This is the place probably more than any other in Europe that I would really like to live next if I had my choice of, you know, perfect situation where there was like a great international school for my kids and a job for my husband. Croatia is amazing. <laughs> and every time we go anywhere in Croatia, we immediately want to go back again. We're going in a couple of weeks so that we can go again. Um, so let's talk about what's fun to do in Croatia. Rovine is the first place we ever went to in Croatia. It's an absolutely lovely city on the north coast of Croatia for warm weather. So we went in the summer, in uh, maybe in July, and people really talk about Rovine as like Instagram heaven. <laughs> Everywhere you look, people are taking pictures. Every woman seems to be wearing like a flowy dress and kind of ready for a photo shoot. Um, all the little nooks and crannies of the pedestrian old town are so pretty. The, the blend of colors, the kind of warm light. And then the sea is peeking in everywhere because it's right on the water. Um, you can go over to one side of the old town and everybody does every night to watch the sunset and also to go swimming. When you go swimming off the coast in Rovine, you want to find some kind of gentle area. And you'll know you found a gentle area if there are some kids swimming there. If you just jump off the rocks into the ocean, you are perhaps in for trouble because the waves are going to are gonna kind of push you back toward those rocks and the rocks are all scrapey. It's not pleasant getting out if you haven't found a gentle place. I've done both. I've gone, you know, ocean pummeled into the scrapey rocks and I found the gentle place and I'm speaking from experience. Okay, another place we really like in Croatia is Zagreb. It's the capital. We tend to go there on our way to other places and just stay for a night or two. But we have a great time on those nights or two. It's a really fun city. It has really great energy. Tons of people just sitting out in cafes, sitting out in outdoor restaurants, hanging out. Um, there are a lot of bookshops there, which I, of course, enjoy. And maybe you do too. And a lot of great restaurants. Zadar is a smaller town, I think, tourism-wise in Croatia. Although we were there in the off-season, maybe in July, there are like 80 million people there. I'm not sure, but um, but it's a really interesting place to stop by because it has these two um, beautiful, huge pieces of public art. One is called The Greeting to the Sun, and it's this very large blue glass... Um, flat sculpture uh, on the end of kind of the pier in the in, at the edge of the old town and all day long it's soaking up sun rays so that at night it can use that solar energy to do like a dancing light show across the plane of its surface and everybody just walks around on top of it on top of the light show the kids are all playing they're dancing they're trying to like step on the lights everywhere. It is so cool. It's cool at dusk. You can start to see it as the sun sets. It's cool at night when it's really dark and you can see all the lights super well. And then right next to it is this thing called the sea organ. And right kind of on the pier there on the walkway, there are all these pipes going into the water and there are these benches sort of cut into the pier where you can sit. And as the sea goes in and out of all the pipes, it plays music. And the music is never the same because the waves are never exactly the same. And so at different times of day, if you stop by and sit there, you can listen to different music created by the ocean. And it's really neat. <laughs> and lots of people are sitting there and listening or having a picnic um, or watching the sunset. And it's it's so nice. So we really liked Zadar. We did get stuck there when our car just had a complete meltdown so we were there for like five days instead of two and we weren't sorry at all we had a great time we loved visiting and revisiting those those really um interactive pieces of public art and then nearby there were some trampolines that the kids could pay to play on and they they loved that so we spent a ton of time at the pay to play trampolines <laughs> right near the sculptures and we visited the sculptures we got some great ice cream at this shop called bob rocks ice cream shop and i would recommend all of those things okay next up i want to share about two national parks in croatia that are both so lovely one is called kirka national park and one is called pleetvice and i think pleetvice is a little bit more popular it's maybe 
20% more stunning. <laughs> and so if you're going to go to Pleat Vitae, you need to book tickets way in advance. You need to book your entry tickets like when you plan your trip so that you can get in. Because if you just come to the gate, I think it will probably be sold out. Both parks have these really lovely wooden walkways kind of winding through the park, winding along the lakes and up the little waterfalls and then providing places where you can see the really huge waterfalls. And both parks are just so lovely. Um, I think they would be lots of fun to visit in different seasons. We went to Pleat Vitae in the fall and Kirka in like the late winter and they were they were both beautiful at those times. We're going to be going back to Pleat Vitae in two weeks to see it um, with some friends who haven't been yet um, and to see it in the spring. And I'm excited to see what it looks like at a different time of year. But just if you're if you're into the outdoors and you enjoy hiking, I think either or both of those parks would be an amazing addition to a, a Croatia trip. Finally, we spent a really fun few days in Dubrovnik. Dubrovnik has become hugely popular. It was um, part of the scenery for Game of Thrones, and that has brought a lot of Game of Thrones fans to the region. Um, but it's just an amazing old walled city, kind of like like nowhere else. We, we walked around it a lot. We hung out on the beach just to the side of the city a lot. It was too cold to swim, but we looked for shells and looked for rocks. And we did a lot of hiking up behind the city where there's a very steep sort of hill cliff leading up to some other towns kind of back inland from Dubrovnik. And we, we really enjoyed hiking up and down um, so that we could see out over Dubrovnik and over the Dalmatian coast because it was so beautiful. We also got a lot of pizza at Pizza Tabasco and we would recommend that. The last thing that was really cool about our trip to Dubrovnik was that we were able to take a day trip to Mostar in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And we really wanted our kids to see um, to see Mostar, to, to climb up in a minaret at um, one of the mosques there in Mostar and just kind of have the experience of the Islamic culture that's that's in that region because we don't see that as much in the other areas of Europe that we've been and we wanted them to like learn more um, about Islamic culture and kind of experience the call to prayer and and see how different cultures are sort of coinciding in Bosnia-Herzegovina and we love Mostar the there's this unbelievably pretty stone bridge over the gorge in the city that was destroyed during um, recent war in that region and then immediately rebuilt after the war because it's such a symbol of the strength and heart of the community there. And so we walked back and forth on the bridge. We, we looked at the bridge from different angles in the summer um, young people in the area dive off the bridge down into the gorge below, which would be really fun to see. And we also just really enjoyed sort of slowly puttering along the lane near the bridge where there are lots of vendors selling art and pottery. We actually met an artist who was doing some paintings that we really liked and he let us come into his shop and he let our daughter help him with the painting. Um, and then we bought a painting and he gave our kids both prints that they liked, which was just I mean, it was it was amazing to meet this painter and talk with him. And he had a little daughter like we had a little daughter and both the little daughters loved Frozen. And, you know, I mean, we were just just really happy to get to meet somebody from the area and learn a little bit about his art um, and, and his his uh, experience in the area. OK, that's our experience in Croatia. We love Croatia. <laughs> we also really love Slovenia. If you were to ask my husband where he would want to live, he would probably say Slovenia. If you asked me, I would probably say Croatia. But they're both just beautiful and they're so close together. It's very easy to plan a trip that involves both. We really like the area in the north western corner of Slovenia. Um, we like the nature up there. We've been to Ljubljana. We had a perfectly nice time. We haven't been back. It's Lake Bled that pulls us back. This little town is so gorgeous. It's on this sort of turquoise blue lake with this 
stunning, tiny fairy tale island in the middle that has this beautiful church on a little hill in the middle of the island. And you can see it from all over and it's just, (laughs) it's so beautiful. And so we like to stay, we've stayed on a farm in the area, we've stayed at an Airbnb and we just, we do a lot of hiking. There's a really neat gorge called Vintgar Gorge that's very beautiful nearby that you can book tickets and walk through. A little ways away from there, there's Lake Bohine, which is equally beautiful perhaps, but without the little island in the middle. And we like to hike there up this area called Most Nietzsche Gorge. Again, you you buy a ticket to kind of support the park maintenance in the area. And you can go a little ways along a beautiful river, or you can go really far and make an all-day hike up to this waterfall up near one of the highest mountains in Slovenia, maybe the highest mountain in Slovenia. And you go through these like alpine meadows, you see horses, you see this beautiful green water. And there are two different huts on the way up where you can stop and have lunch and really like lunch with a view. It is so beautiful and they have such good pie and it's just like, wow, is this is this real? Like how, how can this incredibly beautiful place just be here in the middle of this mountain where I can eat pie? Um Anyway, so we love doing outdoorsy things in this area. Our kids have done rock climbing here. We've done paddle boarding, swimming, hiking. Um, We're planning a trip for the summer. Our son really wants to go paragliding here. There's paragliding. Um, I think my son and husband are going to try to hike up that really high mountain. And my daughter wants to go horseback riding. So I'm probably going to be doing that, even though I'm kind of scared of horseback riding. That's another story. (laughs) So anyway, um, the nice thing too is that because this area has become quite popular, I mean, that's that's a mixed blessing, right? It's It will be crowded in summer, but because it's popular, there are also just a lot of fun little things that have sprung up for kids and so, so much great food. Um, so our kids really enjoy being able to play on like a water obstacle course that's been built in on one side of Lake Bled or this treetop obstacle course that's been built in on one side of Bohine. Uh, There is an amazing pizza place here called Pizza Rustica that I would highly recommend. You can sit on the balcony and just overlook this kind of fairy tale alpine town near you um, and have an amazing pizza. And then a few blocks away, there's a pastry shop called Zima that has the most beautiful cakes. And we like to get the Lake Bled cream cake there, but there's also a lot of other things you can get. Okay, this is a long episode. I get really excited sharing these fun places in Eastern Europe. This this region has become very special to our family. We love it here. Um, we feel so blessed that we've gotten to live here these last few years, and it's fun to get to share it with you. Are there more places I wish I could talk about? Yeah, yeah, I could tell you about the Tatras Mountains in Slovakia, a little bit more about Bratislava where I live. I could tell you some great places in Vienna, but really like I know that if you're coming to this part of the world, you have limited time and these are our absolute favorites. So feel free to direct message me on Instagram if you want tips, if you really want to go to Bratislava, if you really want to go to Vienna. They're awesome cities. But if you're trying to string together like a seven or 10 day itinerary, our favorites would be Prague, Budapest, this little region of Slovenia and like all of Croatia. (laughs) Um, So that's that's our two cents. Okay, thanks so much for listening and for coming with me to Eastern Europe today. Something a little bit different for us. Next week, we'll be back with regular teaching content. Until next time, take care of yourself and stay creative.